So today we have uh, Senator Peter Wish Wilson in the driver's seat. To put it into drive, you just yep. knock down the right hand paddle. That one? Yep. Yep. Now you're in drive. All right, okay. <laughs> Will that directly mimic the motions of the car? So. Yeah, and you'll see as we go out onto the road, you'll see it's, it's, it's actually picked up your car there That's as well. Right. That's incredible. Yeah. So that's all through artificial intelligence, yep. um, machine learning. Yeah. <laughs> Crikey. So why don't we go down to Richmond and go past some beautiful Tasmanian vineyards? Yeah, that sounds great. I used to be a winemaker. I read that, a vin actually. A vinegron. No, that doesn't mean making vinegar. That means I I'm, I'm used to manage the vineyard. It's a good, good time in my life, mate. I got back to, I went back to, to university and um, learned all about soil science. And yeah, look, it's still only one, two percent of national production, yeah. but it's a classic example of an industry. It hasn't needed any government funding. Um, it's high value. Um, it's, you know, they're some of the most expensive wines in the country now. Yeah. Um, it all relies on our brand. Um, they employ lots of people. They're sustainable at a small level. And in, in many ways, the model industry for Tassie that just can't compete with, you know, these big commodity industries like wheat and a whole bunch of other stuff. You know, we're just small island on the bottom of the world. Got to trade off what's special. And I think the yeah. wine industry has captured that beautifully. Yes. Yeah, we're already, um, I mean, Pinot, cool, cool climate Pinot and Chardonnay were originally Tassie's first cultivars because they made sparkling, like the French, you know, cool climate. Yeah. But already now they're making big, robust Margaret River style Chardonnay. Yeah, wow. and, and I just hope it doesn't get too hot for Pinot because that's really our competitive advantage. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a dirt road, so we might give that one a miss for now. Yeah. Your, for your sake. <laughs> Whoops. Well, what, for your sake. Wait till I get the Tesla Cybertruck and come back oh. in a couple of years. We'll try that one. Mate, I, I think just about everyone's on the waiting list for those, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I think they've had 1.2 million pre-orders for the Cybertruck. So they'll be they'll be common in the zombie apocalypse. Everyone will have one. They will, yeah. What do they yeah. cost, Daniel? Okay. Um, there's there's three different types. There's a yeah. single motor, dual motor, tri motor. The, yeah. I think the single motor they've said is going to be around forty thousand US. Okay. So they're they're relatively cheap when you think that you're going to get you know well over a million kilometers out of the battery pack what it does it really smashes out smashes the misconception that um electric vehicles aren't good for like tradies or, or work utes yeah oh that's awesome nrma i remember they came out in the 2019 election with a, a media announcement no more petrol or diesel car sales are new petrol and diesel cars after 2025 in australia of course the real stink like, of course, you know, look at how pro-fossil fuel our government are. Yeah. Um, it was always going to cause trouble for it, but um, good on them for at least raising the conversation. Yeah. Even we were 2030, so they, they were like five years ahead of the Greens. It was like, whoa, that's our peak motorist um, or, you know, body in the country. So yeah, it's, good to see they're thinking that way. Absolutely. And I think that I think it's going to happen a lot faster than people anticipate as well. We've yeah. just seen Hertz just announce that they've ordered 100,000 Tesla Model 3 is the same as this yeah. for, for their fleet, which apparently makes up around 20% of their global fleet, massive rental company. Okay. Um, and you know, it, it's it's absolutely it's it's such a no-brainer to go electric for these rental car companies because the running costs are so low, and they can get you know four, five, six times the mileage out of these vehicles than they can out of internal combustion. Wow. So the the business case is definitely there now. Yeah. Yeah, look, I spoke at a, um, a surf film festival last night. Uh, a lot of surfers are getting active all around the country opposing fossil fuel exploration in the ocean, so basically seismic testing and oil and gas drilling. Um, and, like, it was it was pretty raucous night, and I was like, oh, no one wants to hear from politicians about this kind of thing while they're watching, you know, they're watching all this amazing surf film. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, it was interesting. Like I just kind of, kind of got up and said, "I know, I know you guys all use fossil fuel products in your making of your wetsuits and you drive your cars and surf breaks. And you know, at what point do we transition away from this? Like we all, we all use fossil fuels, and um, we're all aware we've got to get off them. Yeah. And I try, yeah, just explain that. That's government's government's role, right? Is to is to make that transition and. 
explain to them that we've already got enough fossil fuels in reserves at the moment with what's been discovered to push us above two degrees of warming. Yeah. Why the hell are we opening up new areas of ocean to these companies to go and explore for more? It's just, it's madness, but it's actually corruption. Yeah. So these companies are paying our government with do donations for their political, you know, political power and keeping them in power and they get pay for play, you know, they get looked after by the government in policy terms and there's this, this death spiral we've got to get out of, you know, and these are the kind of things that people want to talk about because they're like, how do I, how do I get to my surf break without, you know, go and fill up my car at a petrol station? Well, there's options like this. Yeah. It's just that simple stuff that's really important in people's confidence because they want to talk to their mates about stopping all, you know, seismic testing and why it's dangerous and why, it's, you know... It's, it's insanity, but they're just not confident because they, they know they're going to get those questions. So yeah, the more we talk about this stuff, the better. Yeah, absolutely, and it's yeah, it's it's such a good point. Like, um, electric vehicles really are like the sexy part of the transition. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to stop there because I reckon if yeah. you pull up here, yeah, this is probably the perfect spot. You can stay on the road. There's no one coming behind you. No. So I reckon this is a good spot to do a zero to a hundred. So if you come to a full stop, now. I think you're, you're all good behind you and there's no one ahead. So, do you want to put the sunnies on for this? Mate, I'm going to go all top gun here. I was going to say, it's a shame you don't have the mullet that you had when I met you a few weeks ago because at Coal Miners yeah. Driving Teslas, we do have we do really appreciate a good mullet. Yeah, I bet you've seen a few in your time. It was a mullet all my marriage, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. When you're ready, just plant it. Hang on to it. <laughs> hang, on, hang on to it. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> want to try again? <laughs> oh, I've got my brain going back, back through there through the seat then. Dave right. Foster needed a couple of attempts as well, so right. you're in good company. Hang on to it. Hang on to it. Fucking hell. That is, <laughs> that is something else. I swear, I've been, I thought I was prepared for that because I've seen so many of your videos. Yeah. That was a, um, that's a physiological reaction. Yeah, yeah. It hits you right in the amygdala. So is that G-force, is it? Yeah, that's that's, so that's around 1G. Top, a real Top Gun pilot would be. Exactly, and you got the sunnies, perfect sunnies for that as well. Wow. So, how do these people in these UAPs, mate, these unidentified aerial phenomena, how can they go up and down and to the left and to the right and then disappear out of sight? How do they survive those G-forces? Uh, well, that, that's that's a very good question because you know th that that kind of G-force would probably just turn it into into a into a, a pink mush, basically. <laughs> <laughs> that was really something else. I got to say, I thought I was prepared for that. Most people have, have got to 200 k's an hour. Dave, Dave Foster, I think he got to about 30 or 40 k's an hour before he pulled out. And I think you're about the same as him. So, so what did I get to? Like Pro probably about the same, yeah. Only about 40 k's an yeah. hour. <laughs> 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 well, he competes with uh, the Wish Wilsons for tree chopping. He says they're pretty fierce competitors. Oh, really? Maybe it's you got a few ch choppers in you. So oh, we do, mate. We do. So actually, can we talk about that? Because I know that's a question you've got at a few um, at a few public meetings. Like that road, Tassie's unfortunately the roadkill capital of the world. Um, you were saying these cars can actually learn, can actually uh, learn about roadkill and can detect detect yeah you know, kangaroos and um, yeah deer and other stuff. Yeah. So basically. Um these, these cars have eight cameras around them and basically got a 360 degree vision yeah. and they're sucking in all this data yeah. and they're sending that back to, to Tesla. There's, there's about two million Teslas on the road now with, yeah. with this technology. They send it back to Tesla and Tesla um, puts all this, all this image, imagery data through their machine learning algorithms. And they have a department which is actually, um, it's called a labeling department and they're, they're in charge of labeling the different things in the images. So they'll okay. be labeling, that's a stop sign, gotcha. that's a pedestrian, that's a cyclist, that's yeah. a motorbike rider. Yeah. And the more data they pump, pump through this thing, the better it gets at learning to identify different things. Okay. So they would be, yeah. you know, in the US, they would be saying that's a that's a deer or that's yeah. that's a duck or that is a... Well, we've got know. deer here too, unfortunately. There's a lot of them, a lot of wild fallow deer in Tasmania. They're a real problem. Yeah. And you're going to get worse and worse over time. Yeah, yeah so, so what... What happens uh, now is that they can identify, the, the car will actually identify wildlife. And if, if you jump on YouTube and check out um, Tesla collision avoidance, you'll yeah. see like compilations of Teslas like narrow, narrowly missing 
deer or there's, okay. there's one yeah. with some ducks where they're doing about 100 k's an hour and it's it's kind of dark and the cameras pick up these ducks that are just coming out of the road and it just swerves out of the way just okay. in time you know what I really like about that after accelerating up to that corner normally you'd have to hit your brakes when you go around a corner but the car actually stops for you yeah like it gets you just to the point where like that where the you're at the right speed so you don't wear your brake pads out yeah yeah absolutely and that's that's another um, really good thing for the environment is that um, there, there's there's someone who's done 400,000 kilometers in a Tesla and they've still got the same brake pads so you're hardly using your yeah. brake pads at all and brake pad dust the dust that comes off brake pads actually washes into our, um, our, our rivers and it's it's a really bad pollutant actually for for, for all the, the stuff that lives in our, our look at, rivers. Look at this, mate. How beautiful is this? Yeah, it's magic. It's tazzy. Yeah, right, okay. Well, that makes sense. Um, I can really feel that. At first, I wasn't sure about that aspect of it. I thought, oh, it feels like it's driving quite heavy when you take your foot off. But now I'm used to it, I actually really like it. It's kind of already anticipating what I would be doing with my brakes. Yeah. If I wasn't using them. Yeah, you can essentially drive this car with, with one pedal and, and just use the, the, the actual brake pedal in an in, in emergency kind of thing. I feel like a real chicken shit now that you've told me I've only got 40 kilometers. Well, we can have another go at it if you I'm want. I'm going to have to, mate. Yeah. I'm too competitive to... I've got to beat David Foster. I've at least got to get to 50 kilometers. Yeah, time. especially someone like yourself who's probably ridden, r- r- ridden some pretty big waves in your, in your time. Oh, yes, I have. <laughs> what is it about the electric... Um, the battery, the power in this car that you can go from zero to like 100 in a few seconds. Like, it's, that's an incredible charge when you think about it. Yeah, so so basically internal internal combustion engine vehicles, so yeah. petrol and diesel vehicles, they're, they're what's known in thermodynamics as Carnot cycle engines. Yeah. Yeah. And um, they're limited, the, the maximum efficiency you can get out of a Carnot cycle engine is around 30%. So when you burn a liter of petrol um, in your in your car, only like three hundred mils of that, three hundred milliliters of that petrol is actually yeah. going into motion. Yeah. Seven hundred mils is getting lost in heat and um, and noise. Right. So they're incredibly inefficient. But electric motors run at efficiency rates over ninety five percent. Yeah. And um, because it's electric, it's instant. It's instant torque. Yeah. Whereas internal combustion engine, it, uh, the torque okay. curve takes a while to, to pick up. Okay. Um, so basically, from the moment when you, you touch the accelerator, you're getting all this torque that you don't get um, with I, internal combustion. I really like that. So I can go to 100, all right? And so David only got to 40 kilometers an hour. Dave got to 40, uh, but he did get there after a few attempts, so right. here's your chance. All right. All right. Hit it all the way, all the way. Hang on to it. Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, mate. Oh. Tell you, I, that is insane. Yeah. And you felt safe and. In yeah, control? I did. I, second or third time. Um, yeah, I was probably holding on way too tight, as Maverick was too, mate, according to the Iceman. Yeah. But yeah. I've seen Top Gun five or six times. <laughs> <laughs> Are you in campaign mode now, leading up to the election? Yeah, look, we, we're just. <laughs> Potentially, it could have been early. It could have been this year. You know, we were expecting it back in August, but I think the Delta strain put everything on hold. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it would have been done and dusted now if that hadn't happened. Um, so yeah, it'll most likely be next year. And with COP, with the climate talks this week, um, climate's back on the agenda. Um, I'm just really, really hopeful that people understand what an important time this is in history for them yeah. to actually vote for the change they want to see in the world. Like, we know a lot of people care about climate action, they care about the environment, and they understand the two things are connected. But often when it comes to election time with all the information, they get confused. They, mm. A lot of self, you know, voting for their own self-interest is pretty logical for a lot of people as well. Just trying to get through to them that this is the time for them to actually, you know, register their... register a protest or vote for change, because um, we're not going to get it otherwise. Another four years of this government, uh, it'll be a disaster. But we'll never meet our 2030 trajectory to get anywhere near where we need to be in 2050 if we don't change government. Yep. I've just seen that how destructive they've been up close. I've witnessed them tearing apart the clean energy package, the carbon price. I've watched it all go down in flames over the years. I've watched them change three prime ministers because of you know, so-called climate action. Mm. 
Um, I've watched how, how captured they are by the fossil fuel industry, now by the nationals who, you know, literally holding a gun to the head of the country. It's got to, it's got to change. Yep. And we've just got to keep it simple to people and say, hey, even if you vote green once in your life, now's the time to do it. Yep. Because if you don't, if they don't see that message, they won't, they won't care. They'll never change. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's all about holding on to power for the big parties, and they've got to know that people care about this issue. Yeah. So it's an anxious time for me too, mate. To be honest, because you know this is what the green movement was set up to do 40 years ago to to be in parliament and change the system from within, and we've never seen the environment more threatened than it is now. So yep. we've really got to, we've really got to get people on board. Yeah, absolutely, and it, it is it is such an anxious time for for so many people who who really like get the the, the situation with the climate. Yeah. As you said, there's so many people that want to see climate action, but I, I still think that a lot of those people don't fully grasp the enormity of the or the seriousness of the of the situation. No. Um, so it's. Yeah, it's really now or never, and um, it's so important to hold um, the the government to account on their on this fraudulent twenty fifty target. And it's not it's not really a target. All it is is a delaying tactic. It's delays a new denial, right? Like, yeah. yeah, it's it's totally. And as soon as you see Murdoch jumping on board, you know that it's dodgy. Yeah, um, they just they just basically want it to go away in this election issue. So. They're whispering sweet nothings in the ears of Australians. Um, you know, Morrison's pretty good at spinning stuff. That's that's kind of his his career before he got into politics. He's, yeah, he really just doesn't have any substance at all, and nor do they have any policies of any substance. Yeah. Um, but I think it's it, you know when you talk details with people and you talk numbers and you talk technical stuff and they do get really confused and overwhelmed by it. I think I think you know as a movement, the green movement, people do. They're very values based and emotions based, and they they love nature. They love animals. They like bushwalking. They like their beaches the way they are. They like going fishing in the ocean. I think just trying to get them to understand that the world's changing and those values are being are being impacted. Yeah. And that that affects them as well. Yeah. I think that kind of just that basic being human, you know, appealing appealing to people's humanities is where we've got to get to, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and also providing optimism and hope. So one thing I'm doing at the moment is people don't people a lot of Australians know the Great Barrier Reef has suffered terribly in the last decade with three mass coral bleaching. So half the coral cover is gone. One of the biggest ecosystems on the planet, you know, um, as you can see from space, is dying, and it, it will be gone by 2050 according mm. to all the latest science. But so, what they don't realise off the coast here in Tassie, um, we had this we've had this massive ecosystem. The, the Barrier Reef's only um, about 80,000 years old, which is really young mm-hmm. in geological history. But our giant kelp forests off Tassie are tens of millions of years old, and they've all vanished in the last 10 years as wow. well. They've been slowly disappearing for the last 30 years because of warming oceans. Um, a lot of changes that we're seeing in the oceans from climate change have essentially killed this massive habitat that also stretched for thousands of kilometres. Our fisheries are all in collapse here. Our commercial fisheries and aquaculture industries are suffering. And people are just starting to wake up to it. But when I go around and talk to people about it, they don't want to hear about this stuff that's going on. It, 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 they're kind of getting saturated with bad news. So yeah. we talk optimism. We say, right, well, you know, you've got to take climate action to fix it, but there's other things we can do. So we're talking, they've just started experimenting with regrowing giant kelp. Mm-hmm. And what they've done is they've found these forests. There's just a few little patches, on, and I mean little, like hundreds of square metres. That's it. Wow. They've gone and they said, why have these little patches of kelp survived and everything else has died? And they've taken these kelp, the genetics from these forests, and they've grown them in the lab and they've put them out in the ocean. And a police report within 12 months, first time that's ever been done, within 12 months, um, two of the four sites have thrived, the other two didn't didn't survive. But they've grown, one pe- couple of the kelp a couple of the kelp strands have grown by um, 12 metres in a year. Wow. And they've survived a hot summer from really vulnerable, small... 12 metres in a year? 12 metres in a year. Is that how, is that how fast they oh, grow? Oh, they grow faster than that. Bloody hell. These are some of the fastest growing plants on the planet. Wow. They sequester more carbon than any other any other plant. Oh, so, really? Yeah, and, they, and of course, they, um, you know, they're, they're reproductive on their own. Um, and the habitat for all these wonderful creatures in the ocean that we, we love and we you know we need for healthy oceans so 
so we're just going around the state at the moment and we're talking to all these coastal communities about what, what they've seen and sharing their experiences and what they can do and we're just getting so many people signing up for a right it's like coast care for the ocean i want to be part of a group that's going to replant these things and monitor them and do citizen science for yeah our scientists and we're getting we're trying to drive that optimism to you know try and fix the problem as well as understand why we need yeah. to climate action yeah, that's that's fantastic, and we do need these optimistic uh, story. We need these hopeful stories, and all the like, all the solutions are there, and we can we can transition away from coal, oil, and gas much more rapidly than we're led to believe with with electric vehicles and and clean tech, and then yeah, with with these kind of things, we also have um, some incredibly smart scientists working on keeping these. Um, uh, keeping these kelp um, forests alive. Yeah. Um, so if we can just stop uh, adding to the problem, stop stop well, putting the, the carbon into the atmosphere. Yeah, you have to do both, right? Like the yeah. same for Barry Roof. Is, unlike down here, we've got no federal no federal funding at all. This has all been done off the back of community fundraising um, and, and and engagement. There's billions of dollars have been put into regrow, trying to regrow corals on the Barry Roof. Yeah. Um, because it's globally, it's, a, it's receiving global attention. Yeah. But there's a lot of uh, focus now about how all the world's kelp forests are disappearing. And this is something Charles Darwin and the voyage of the Beagle. In 1812, Charles Darwin had this love affair with kelp. And he said, he had this quote, which is almost prophetic and, and it's very, very troubling. He, he said that, you know, he'd seen the great uh, terrestrial forests of the uh, intertropical regions up in New Guinea and Borneo and some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. But he said when he was off Terra de Fuego in South America, he said, if the world was to lose these kelp forests, we would lose more animals and creatures and biodiversity than we would in these intertropical Fair regions. Fair And he was absolutely right. They're the most biodiverse forests on the planet and they've virtually disappeared. Wow. So there's a big push on uh, around the world now to try and protect the remaining kelp forests and uh, and see what we can do to regrow them because clearly some of them are, 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 have adapted Funny enough, through Charles Darwin's theory, yeah, um, you know, origin of the species and um, uh, you know the selfish gene and all that kind of stuff and um, natural so, selection and 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 we can potentially regrow these um, regrow these forests. Yeah, wow. So he was onto it 130, 135 he, years he ago. It was a very haunting quote. It was like yeah. he predicted what might come. And don't want to get too philosophical with you, but he was the guy that you know he came up with this theory of natural selection survival of the fittest which is essentially what our capitalist and political system is yeah and it's exactly the reason our kelp forests are disappearing so he he predicted this this you know this philosophy and uh i suppose you know process that or road that we were going to go down as a species like other species have yeah you know this drive for profits and competition and greed uh and with and you know which if we've left unchecked is going to totally fuck us basically yeah, yeah. um and that's that's what that's where we're at. So I, I just find that very, 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 very interesting. Reading. Yeah. Um, but um, you know the solutions there. So we're, we're intelligent enough, smart enough. We can engineer cars like this. Yeah. And our way out of a problem, we can do it in our ecosystems. And this is the UN decade of ecosystem restoration. This is when we get the young people of the world to say, look, you know that that Lake Pedder, that amazing ecosystem. Uh, that start of the global green political movement. Um, we can get that back and all the riparian environment and that went with it. We, we can do this, it's gonna create thousands of jobs and keep people really invested in, you know, in, in nature yeah. and, and what's special. We don't have to go down this rapacious capitalist road where we ruin everything for the sake of a few bucks. Yeah. And, and, and quite simply to read, you know. Yeah, and the, the government has the capacity to do these things that the, the coalition often tries to scare people by saying that, you know, we're going to lose jobs, um, blah, 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 if, if we, you know, move away from fossil fuels. And it's just not true. Like, yeah. The government has the capacity to, to pump, pump money into projects like you're talking about um, to create jobs in restoration and, yeah. and rewilding. Um, the government totally has the capacity to do all these things, but it's, cho it's choosing not to. Yeah. And, and that is the, the most tragic thing about this, this, whole, um, this whole situation. But it is changing. We're seeing, the, we're, seeing the, um, we're seeing exponential growth in 
clean technology, electric vehicles, yep. solar and wind, but we're also seeing exponential growth in the climate movement and the broader environmental movement yep. as well. Yep. And all these things um, kind of intersect. So as electric vehicles grow exponentially, the, the oil industry dies at an exponential rate. Yep. Therefore, it has less money to contaminate our politics with. Then, then we get better, um, stronger democracy, and we get better outcomes for for inv- for the environment. So, yep. even though I think you and I, we've been watching this play out over over the last twenty years, probably longer, yep. um, and it's been incredibly depressing and and um, and horrible and, to and, watch. And but things, and things have got were a lot worse than I ever expected they would be. I yeah. mean, I, I genuinely believe that, and I know a lot of other people do that. Things have tipped so much faster than we're all expecting. Yep. Even five years ago, I, I didn't believe I'd see half the Barrier Reef disappear. I don't think anybody did. Even the best scientists in the world didn't believe that. Yeah. It's a, it's just strange tension for me as a politician because it's the old adaption versus mitigation debate, right? Mitigation is stopping climate at it, you know, the emissions and the pollution at its source. Adaption is living with climate change. And the, the coalition's very strong spin and frame especially on the Barrier Reef, has been we can adapt to climate change, we can create lots of jobs, we can do these wonderful things. And, yeah, we've got to do that. But they, that, 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 they use that to totally distract away from the mitigation debate. Yeah. That is cutting fossil fuels, their emissions. And the truth is, all the money in the world is not going to restore the Barrier Reef on these co price if exactly. the ocean keeps warming. Yeah. So people have got to understand it. I support those initiatives because they're taking action and it gives people optimism. But um, I'm not optimistic we have any future with these ecosystems if um, if we don't actually cut emissions and, and radically cut emissions. How bizarre that David Attenborough, who just about everyone loves, came out and said we can't be radical enough in, in tackling climate change. I mean, that's coming from a guy that's universally loved yeah. and respected. I'll try and use that as often as I can, yeah. especially with the older crew, like my dad's generation, that they understand climate and some of them understand the legacy or what kind of legacy they're going to leave. I keep going... Keep uh, going straight, straight, yep. Yeah, but um, they don't, most people don't understand that we're not taking anywhere near radical enough action. And the government's 2050 plan is a classic example. It's really going to do nothing. It's not going to change a thing. In fact, if anything, it's going to totally avoid taking any action. Yeah, exactly. And it just allows the fossil fuel industry to continue to put um, more CO2 into the atmosphere and further change... What, what they're actually doing is changing the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah. We've, got to, we've, got to, we've got to remind ourselves this sometimes, that um, we're actually changing the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere. And it's like um, we, th- there's, no, there's no coming back from that. It's like, it's like trying to put toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah. You know, um, every, every day Australia puts another 1.5 million tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And... This issue is not getting the level of attention that, that it deserves in, in the Australian media or even around the world, to be honest. Yeah. We need an all-out um, World War II scale effort to get off fossil fuels as fast as we possibly can. Yeah. Um, because the, what we're facing is, is an absolutely horrific future. Yeah. And as you say, it's happening faster than we've been led to believe. And every year, oh. every year we hear that actually um, it's not 70 now years away, it's, it's now 30 years away. And then the next year it's like, oh, actually it's not yeah. 30 years away, it's five years away. Well, the IPCC, I've watched the various reports come out over the years since I've been in politics. And those 230 or so scientists are really conservative. They've got to agree to every word in those reports. You know, that kind of wordsmithing is really, really tough. So whatever you see in those reports is going to be conservative. Yeah. Underestimate the risks just by the nature of the process. And you've watched how even that's changed. You know, the, the whole code red for humanity on the edge of an irreversible disaster. This kind of messaging that's come out of the UN only this year is something I, once again, never thought I would ever see yeah. from that body. So that means it's really serious. Yeah. Um, and and uh, these climate scientists are openly admitting they got it wrong. They yeah. actually got it wrong. Uh, so Malcolm Roberts has got it around, he's got it around the, the wrong way himself, but he keeps saying that they're wrong. But they're openly saying, "Hey, this is much worse than we, we ever thought it was going to be." Yeah. Um, so yeah, where does where, do, where does that leave us in thirty years' time? Three hundred meters turn left. This is the thing, the but I mean, we have to stay optimistic and hopeful. And again, yeah. like we're seeing huge um, a huge change in the political landscape around the world. We just saw 
um, in the in the German we just saw in the German election that, yeah. that there was a massive swing to the Greens yeah. and now we've got the SPD and the Greens which are are going to uh, take strong action on climate. That's right, um, uh, and yeah, people are demanding it because you know because up in the northern hemisphere they're seeing the changes. Yeah, they're seeing the uh, the, the fire, the unprecedented fires and heat waves and loss of insects, and it's really visceral. Um, and 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 these. Unlike Tassie and some other places in Australia, in these countries have lost a lot of their right old, their name. wild places, their old growth forests. They've lost them years ago. Yeah, um, it's the same when I went to Israel. Like they're really green there, but they've got not, not much left. Right? Yeah, we've just got we've just got this yeah, turn left right here. Yeah, right. lane. We've got this incredible wild state that we live in. That there's not many places left on the planet that can access wilderness like you can here and yet it's because there's so much of it people don't seem to care as much about it yeah we have an abundance of it well we we, we used to have an abundance of it but we're it's slowly it's, sl oh, slipping it's away definitely shrinking yeah. yeah definitely shrinking um yeah i flew over the tarkine years ago in a helicopter and you know that 400,000 hectares that we want to protect mm. and i thought this is impregnable you know it's such a big area but then when i got to the edge i could see the plantations where they've been logging on all the way meters, and turn then right to stay on backers lane and then you and then as you keep flying you fly you suddenly realize you've flown over an area two or three times that size that was cleared yeah. already wow now, when then, then you suddenly realize there's only a little bit of it left really in, in perspective yeah so yeah, for future generations, mate. I mean, that's the definition of sustainability, right? Everyone uses it for, as a throwaway line, but what it means is you leave the planet in the same fucking shape that you inherited it. Yeah. And how many of us can say that's the case for our generation? I can't. Yeah. My generation's won the lottery of life, mate, Generation X. Yeah. You know, we, we missed all the wars, we inherited, you know, uh, when we grew up, we inherited right full employment. You know, you could buy a house fairly cheaply. Most people, most people had a good good life, mate. There was no climate change really when I grew up. Yeah. And now, um, you know, all these young generations of um, have inherited this, you know, this sense of doom about their future. Yeah, but that that said, um, I mean, the, the millennials and especially the the Gen Z, the Gen Zs are fierce. Bloody they are they, super they, fierce. They are, and that's what yeah. gets me out of bed in the morning. To be honest, Daniel, it's just that the fact that they're there and they're fighting. It's like so inspiring for yeah. me. Yeah. Every year. Another year, another year's worth of Gen Zs come into voting age, yeah. and they know what they want. You know, they want action on climate, and they're, they're not going to they're not going to take no for an answer. Yeah. You know, so that's that gives me a lot of a lot of hope as well. Okay, All right. So I think we're this one. Is yeah. One twelve. Yeah. This is it here. So if we just if you want to park here and we can wrap it up. Yep. So if you just push the P button on the end of the uh, paddle on on the paddle. Um, oh yeah okay yep gotcha so that's in park yep and that's it and right. uh senator Peter on a positive Wilson. note about the gen z's yeah absolutely hopefully we'll all have these you know affordable for you when you're buying your first car that you're yeah. able to buy one for 15 20 grand like you can uh or at least a good second hand one right well the price is coming um, down quick and i know tesla's coming out with a twenty five thousand dollar car in, in a couple of years so okay. the, the price trajectory is 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 rapidly de de decreasing yeah but um yeah so when you go for a surf you can put on your wetsuit that's being made by um non-synthetic rubber with no petroleum products in it patagonia are making them already yeah uh, and you'll be able to drive to the beach in a, an electric and car. you can surf guilt-free totally <laughs>